it on our last session of the meeting. Uh, you've made it this far, so great job, everyone. Um, Shilber, are you on? Yes, I am on. Okay, great. Fantastic. Just wanted you to show your face. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it's my pleasure and the pleasure of my co-chair, Shilba, to welcome you to the last session um, at this meeting. Uh, many of you may wonder why a PD from NIA is hosting the last session. And this is because I was formerly a program director at the NCI, and I was actually one of the co-chairs for this meeting uh, before accepting a new position at NIA. Um, but it seems that Trump, Shoba, and Joanne, they're not ready to get rid of me yet. So here I am. <laughs> so for this session, um, we will seek to facilitate cross-discipline collaborations for our attendees. The outputs will help to inform concrete coordination for NCI program staff. And so what we will do over the next few minutes is to have a recap of the key issues that emerged from each one of the sessions over the past two to three days. So we've asked each one of our moderators for these sessions to prepare two to three slides of relevant issues for a five minute presentation. And then this will be followed by um, a discussion and in particular, it's hoped that we'll be able to address what could be accomplished in the short term, what is the long term or what are the long term objectives and what topics for future discussions and opportunities for collaborations. So in effect, what you're starting to do here is to think of a roadmap for moving forward as a cohesive unit. Um, I also wanted to remind you that, we, you know, at this point, you have the full attention of the NCI program staff. And so I don't have to say this because everyone has been um, given their input, but it's really important to make sure that you share your thoughts and your ideas for moving forward and to ensure that you that you are heard. And as uh, was stated earlier, um, Dr. Sharpless will be here to close out the meeting along with um, Dr. Napoles from the Deputy Director from NIMHD of the Intramural Program. So with that said, we'll, we'll go to our first um, moderator, Dr. Trapito. I think you are up first. And, oh, and if you have any questions, comments that you would like to make, please enter it into the chat box. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, uh, Damali and Shoba. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. And Amelie, who helped that process, too. Um, so I'm going to reflect a little bit on um, the first session. And some of this is going to be repeat. So I'll go faster through that. Um, and to advance the slides, uh, there we go. Okay. So the key points, and we've we've been hitting on this um, uh, throughout the meeting of, of race and ethnicity, and researchers and community may not have the same understanding of the issues and why they are or are not important. Simple categorizations may be helpful for some things, but they're not useful for research. There are inconsistencies between data sources for some uh, items. Uh, some some data considerations of, um, you know, how do we look, for example, at the meaning of acculturation as the percentage of Hispanic Latinos who are born in this country increases? Um, do we need to readjust what we think acculturation is? There's also tremendous multi-correlation of variables, e even ancestry. Uh, as was pointed out uh, yesterday or the day before, uh, being associated with English fluency. Um, an issue that was recently brought up again is should comparisons continue to be made to white non-Hispanics? Um, we talk about, you know, if, if a rate of cancer is lower in Hispanics, Latinos, then white non-Hispanics, does that make it not worth studying? Of course not. And so I think that there, there's some disservice done by continually referring back to white non-Hispanics. Um, and then this is a little bit self-serving, but it was also shown, uh, an early slide showed the growth of um, Hispanic and Latinos throughout the country. And yet most of our studies come from the same areas time and time again. And, and there are these pockets that are growing that have um, usually 
uh, more homogeneous populations of, of Latinos and certainly could be used to uh, expand what we know about cancer. Next slide, please. So future directions, in improving the assessment of early lifetime exposures, which are re very relevant for cancer etiology. Um, another thing, and, and Dr. Ramirez talked about partnering with an IHS, we're, we need to find out about historical exposures. Those are not always easy to come by. Um, and while wearables, which are currently um, being promoted, are useful, for some things, they're not particularly important for long-term ex environmental exposures because what people are exposed to now does not uh, affect their risk for cancer probably for the next 10 years. What we need are exposures from the past. Um, then the issue of genetic de determination of ancestry and how that relates to self-identification and how to use both when the associations are being made between um, origin and cancer. Certainly there's a need for multi-generational studies. An example was pointed out during the, the two days uh, before, um, and we've learned a lot from multi-generational studies in epidemiology, but not among Hispanic populations. We need to expand the paradigm for domains involved in the process of cancer development and outcomes among Hispanic and Latino populations. Some of the more simplistic approaches are just not adequate. And then how to, um, st to study how different Hispanic Latino populations receive state-of-the-art cancer therapy. And with that, I will pass it back to Damali. Great, thank you so much. We'll just keep moving into the next moderator. I think is Ramirez is, is up next. Hey. Yes. Hi, Denali. Um, yeah, if we can just go on to the next slide. And again, I, uh, along with Dr. Trapito, want to thank <clears throat> all of NCI and all of you for putting this wonderful uh, opportunity together and, and sharing in the dialogue uh, in this important issue. I mainly summarized what, some of the discussions that were held in kind of part two of, uh, of our session. And uh, here we really talked about the need to look at uh, genetic ancestry, because we all know that Latinos are very heterogeneous population and there's so much that we need to, to better understand uh, about the, the uh, not only generational differences, but uh, you know, where originally our, many of our populations have come from. Uh, and so and this also includes looking at germline, for example, for gastric uh, cancer and mutations that are occurring uh, also in our childhood cancers. Um, in terms of, um, we also need to look at, uh, you know, why we have such an underrepresentation in our cancer uh, registries like the TCGA. Uh, I know there have been efforts from NCI to in increase minority representation in, in these registries, but we need to do so much more because these limit our, our understanding of um, get, doing better research with, with our population groups. And uh, this is particularly important, uh, you know, in cancers with that are disproportionate, uh, uh, you know, in our Latino uh, communities, again, such as liver, gastric and, and childhood cancers. Um, as Dr. Trapito just mentioned, environmental is, uh, is issues are something we need to really focus on, looking at uh, how is that impacting genetics and the host interactions. And uh, again, not just immediate exposures, but past exposures uh, as well. And then in terms of the survivorship issue, this is really a, a complex issue. Uh, and uh, as we were discussing earlier, many of the instruments that we're currently using to assess some of the uh, quality of life uh, impact on our populations um, are sometimes not quite understandable, but those are the only standard instruments that we have for um, our population group. So we, we need to do a lot more to improve on those. And, uh, and we need to, to look at how we can improve access to care and treatment um, because we have such large uninsured populations and also looked at you know, psychosocial and spiritual and cultural factors and how that um, relates to the resiliency and, and some of the familismo that we see in, in our uh, populations and the uh, quality related uh, life issues. Um, so these were kind of some theme areas that we found across the presentations that were given in, uh, in part two of our session on day one. And on the next slide, if somebody could, 
there we go. Uh, in terms of future directions, uh, again, trying to have a better understanding of the interactions between genetic ancestry and, and our different behaviors, including um, environmental exposures, and also beginning um, requiring a kind of priority setting, you know, amongst our multidisciplinary research teams. Uh, and, and looking at uh, regional efforts, because we know there's large populations in the southwest U.S., but we see growing populations along the East Coast as well. And so we, we have opportunities to do regional research as well as um, international uh, research efforts as well. Um, and then another theme that we kept talking about was the role of inflammation on, on the different cancers. So let's definitely keep that in mind, diet and inflammation uh, are some key risk factors that we need to look at. Um, <clears throat> we need more of a genetic sources of cancer risk uh, to, to again, understand what's going on in our communities. We need to have more culturally aware genetic counselors because again, as we find out more about our genetics, but very few Latino families and um, have access to a genetic counselor. So we, we need to be able to match our research needs along with support resource services that our community might, might um, need. Um, we need better understanding of the social uh, economic status and social determinants of health and how they mediate poor survival outcomes in, in our communities. Um, and again, um, combining that with genetic variation and impact of the environment. Um, all of this is needed to help us better reduce the disparities and promote better uh, health equity. And last but not least, again, the, the, the importance of survivorship interventions that are culturally adapted and really focus on the psychosocial outcomes and health-related quality of life uh, in our populations to help um, you know, uh, look at issues dealing with uh, reducing mortality and recurrence uh, issues. So these are some of the major kind of future directions that were um, common among some of the presentations given in the part two of our presentations. So thank you. Great, thank you so much. Um, our third speaker is Dr. Lei. Hello, doc. thank you, Dwali, thank you, Shoba. So I'm just gonna be going a brief overview of um, our, the first session, the individual sessions, and the session that I moderated was on surveillance and research challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So our, our first set of um, our talks by the first two speakers, Dr. Kathy Cronin and Dr. Maggie Kodischewski, were really de dealing with their experiences and the challenges that um, relate to um, cancer registries, both at the federal level and at a state level. Um, Dr. Cronin discussed about how you know, the accuracy of ethnicity information in registries, they do vary in particular by Hispanic subgroups. And this unfortunately has an effect on the population incidence rates and survival estimates. And she briefly did discuss some um, other aspects, but specifically about efforts that are, that are being made to have perhaps obtain more accurate estimates. And with some of her current, the, some of the current efforts of, of her and her team looking at Hispanic subpopulations in the years between um, the 2010 and 2020 um, decennial censuses. And then, Dr. Kulishevsky mentioned about challenges at the, at the state level, specifically in New York, about as similar to what Dr. Cronin mentioned about accuracy, um, issues about accuracy of data on race, ethnicity, and nativity status and country of origin, as well as the differences of Hispanic category and, and the, the issues related to um, about diagnosing cases, but lack of availability of follow-up of follow and uh, this relationship with regards to the salmon bias or salmon effect. And she did report on current trends in, in New York and then about how the proportion of diagnosed cases of, of those who self-identified as Hispanic has increased, but that there were definitely observed differences in some of the survival curves by birthplace. Again, and again, this is relating to um, a number of different methodological issues, including the um, salmon effect, salmon bias. Next slide, please. And then Dr. Um, pa Paolo um, Pinheiro, I guess is an earlier version of what I had, um, but Dr. Paolo Pinheiro mentioned about um, his own experiences in using the existing registry data and about how, um, how he, since there's a lot of um, heterogeneity, that there's a lot of challenges in evaluating that heterogeneity. And, and, and he's seen that, that there's a lot of variability in assessing race, ethnicity among minorities. And that this is really a, a part of it is, has to do with some incomplete data on Hispanic origins and that evaluating survival in Hispanics is very challenging due to a number of methodological problems, again, very similar to what Dr. Um, Kulishevsky mentioned. And um, he did um, provide some um, suggestions for improvement. And this, I, I had a separate slide again on future um, directions, but, um, but basically 
one of the things that he suggested was that perhaps uh, mandatory requirements for detailed info on ethnicity and country of birth and linkages um, to the Social Security Administration for data on country of birth and sta standardization of Hispanic death linkages. And perhaps that there be a, a, a need or a push for um, protocols and, and registries to balance out perhaps the follow-up of race this eth ethnic specific specificity. He, he himself gave some examples of his own um, experiences and perhaps and what he was doing to tackling some of these challenges and that, that um, helped motivate some of his areas of research, including looking at some cancers that are a little bit more fatal and, and due to the higher accuracy that he was able to attain. And I believe that was the last slide, but um, basically um, just briefly that some of the other future directions was that from the registries that uh, that there be continuing work to obtain accurate estimates of race and ethnicity and that there'd be additional work needed to, to improve cancer outcomes, of course, for Hispanic populations um, based upon this work. Great, thank you. And uh, next up, Dr. Mahavir. Thank you, Damali. So um, I'm gonna pro pro uh, provide a brief overview of this session that I moderated. And this session was, um, um, we had six speakers. We had six, uh, three researchers from outside of NIH, and we had three NIH staff. So this was a fireside chat, and the topic was, uh, what are the lessons learned from epidemiology research in Hispanic populations and sharing of resources? Next slide, please. So in terms of some of the key ideas, one thing that came out here, um, and I think this kind of recurred in the workshop, that these terms, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, these are all constructs that are unfamiliar to most individuals outside of the United States. So this is something to me that was very important. So there has to be a lot of consideration about these constructs and you know, how we think about uh, you know, the science and the biological side of things here. Also, um, in terms of recruitment into studies and some of the, the, the issues with recruitment, one, one approach was that, 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 that um, was presented, the question should be asked to um, you know, the participants that whether you consider yourself Hispanic or Latino. In, and in addition to that, um, you know, there, there needs to be, in addition to the, the, the heritage question, you know, pertaining to Latino and, and, and uh, Hispanic, there need to be some additional race identifier type of question, such as whether, you know, black, um, white, and, and maybe other categories. I was surprised to see Asian in there as well, but, but it's true. Also, what um. What came out in the session is this idea that, you know, there's a lot of resources that are actually there already that can be leveraged. And so there were several examples from the presenters outside of NIH and also from our NIH colleagues. And these are some examples here. You have the multi-ethnic cohort study that was presented by uh, Dr. Wendy Setiawan, and she highlighted the tremendous resource there and some of the pioneering efforts to study cancer risk and, and other things. And then you have things like Saul, you have guts growing up together, you have the, the NHS three, which is Nurses Health Study three, all of these things and several more, I don't wanna, I mean, you know, those were presented, so you're familiar with them, I don't wanna bore you. These are resources that can be leveraged. Also, one thing that came out was there were several national alcohol surveys. And interestingly, about 13,000 interviews with households who are US Hispanics are available. So another very important uh, resource is, is there that can be leveraged. Next slide, please. Okay. So some other key ideas here, again, this is, probably a recurring idea that the length of residence in the United States reduces the mortality advantage of Hispanics. But the, uh, the, the reasons for those things, the mod modifiable risk factors, you have environmental exposures and so forth. These things are not known. Again, like what came out in the entire conference is this idea of the Salmon effect, 
where people, when they get older and they're ready to die, they go back to their country of origin. So the mortality data in the United States for Hispanics may not necessarily be accurate. That is something we need to consider. And for cancer incidents and mortality studies in Hispanic populations, there are currently, in some states at least, uh, cancer registries that can be utilized and in some places where applicable series there. And there are also um, you know, opportunities for um, linkages to state as well as national death registries and things like that. There may also be opportunities to link to other databases such as Medicare. Um, there are also a lot of challenges with these things that were dis discussed in the um, session. So also from our NIH colleagues, you know, we have learned that their NIH has a large and growing portfolio of research grants targeting Hispanics and other minority populations across the uh, different ICs, okay? And um, another important thing is that for successful recruitment to occur, there has to be some sort of reassurance of confidentiality. This is very, very important. It is very important to have bilingual interviewers as well. It is important to offer some sort of incentive or compensation and very critically important to have follow-up calls with the uh, recruit, with, with the participants. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, in terms of future directions, you know, in terms of these social constructs, Hispanic, Latino, Latinx, there's a need to identify the, the heritage or background when describing the population. So that was something important. The country of origin variable is also important to enable the, you know, the data disaggregation. This is for getting at the different subgroups of Hispanics and Latinos. And also, um, you know, there's opportunities to uh, leverage the existing resource to, um, to collaborate and research investigations into gaps. Some of the things that we are studying currently, we have examples that were presented in the session, for example, on cancer, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, and Alzheimer's. But there's tremendous opportunities to expand into other areas as well. And, you know, um, this will give some opportunities to better understand why the rates are different in um, different ethnic groups and within the, you know, the different um, subgroups of the Hispanic Latino population as well. Okay, so uh, overall, there is a need to uh, train more Hispanic uh, researchers to expand the research pool. There is also uh, interest to, um, to start at least thinking now about how is it that we can convert some of the existing Hispanic cohorts that are aging or maturing to cancer epidemiology cohorts because I think they are at the stage where where, where they're now seeing sufficient number of cancer cases. And finally, there's a need to expand uh, across NIH collaborations in funding these types of research that includes sizable populations of Hispanic heritage. Because we all know that to understand disparities and to understand ethnic uh, racial differences, we have to have different types of populations to compare to. So thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. Uh, last speaker, Dr. Galicchio. All right, I'll be quick. I think a lot of this is repetitive as to what has been discussed already today. So can I do it myself for next slide? So if you recall, this session was really in two parts. One was on international research collaborations and Hispanic populations. So key points from Laura and Jill's presentations are cancer research in Hispanic Latinos is an international effort. International research can provide clues to factors associated with cancer risk and poor outcomes in the US Hispanic Latino population. So this research is needed. And as Laura presented, there are different models for international research collaborations and each have their own pros and cons. So it's important to consider those when deciding how to best approach the important research questions. 
future directions. I think we heard that there's a need for support to continue this ongoing international research and maintain associated resources and databases. As Samdat said, there, there are a lot of resources and data that have been collected and we need to make sure we leverage these resources. And following that continuing, we need to continue and to increase our data and resource sharing so we can better utilize what we have to answer questions. Next slide. And the second part of the session was on the landscape of NCI research and opportunities. Some key ideas from this part of the session was that NCI resources available to investigators wishing to conduct cancer epidemiology research in Hispanic and Latino populations include the NCI cohort consortium, our CEDCD website, which really is a place where investigators can go to look at what populations are available. And as we talked about in some of our breakout groups, perhaps there's a way to enhance this to do research in subpopulations and different ethnic groups. And there's also ongoing um, division of cancer epidemiology and genetic studies. That's our intramural division. There are studies ongoing within Hispanic and Latino populations. And these investigators are um, open to collaboration. Amy Kennedy reported on the many NIH FOAs that are available to investigators who wish to submit applications focused on cancer in Hispanic Latino populations. And again, um, there was a presentation on DCEG intramural research. There was a, uh, she presented, part of that presentation was on the CONNECT cohort, which it was noted that there was a low percentage of Hispanics in that cohort and some discussion about expanding possible future expansion of recruitment to enrich this study sample with Hispanic and Latinos. Future directions, I think uh, Samdat did a great job of um, pointing this out in his short presentation to explore the use of non-cancer epidemiology cohorts to answer cancer-related questions in Hispanic and Latino populations. And we should include thinking about um, the all of us cohort and what those that that um, cohort may be able to help us answer in this population. And again, I put it here um, on this slide, we need to continue leveraging our data and data and resource sharing. And that's all I have for my session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for sharing. Um, there, are, I, I do, I see that there are a lot of comments and the conversation is continuing in the um, chat section. So keep adding them. All of this is going to be very useful um, to us going forward. Um, one question that I wanted to pose to the moderators and to our audience um, in terms of engaging um, Hispanics in other geographic regions within the U.S. Um, that we haven't been able to, uh, to engage. So one of the things that was striking to me um, was the presentation uh, from, I believe it was Scarlett uh, Gomez, who showed the um, states that are uh, that have the, the largest prevalence of um, uh, increasing population, uh, increasing numbers for Hispanic populations. And when we tend to look at where you know, those uh, populations are located, they're located in areas that we don't see a lot of NIH funding. And um, this may be because of the lack of research infrastructure or institutions that are in those particular areas um, for uh, that we could uh, partner with to do research. So I wonder if anyone from the audience or any of the moderators could really talk about how do we engage investigators in these regions, um, North Dakota and the Midwest, where we may see increasing Hispanic populations um, to start to make sure that we're capturing as many people in as many geographic regions as we can. And that's to anyone in the audience or anyone of the moderators. Amali, 
Many uh, of yes. us, many of us are, you know, also working more for diversity. You know, a good forum for that is the Minorities in Cancer Research Council or the Minorities in Cancer Research, which is actually has a lot of support from the NCI, from the Center for Reduce, for Cancer Disparities. You know, we we normally have meetings in most. In, in, we you know the MICR has activities in all or nearly all AICR meetings. This group organizes the cancer disparities meeting, which is an annual meeting. You know, and there are plenty of opportunities for minority scientists to support them travel into the meetings. So you know that, would, that I think that is a good forum to to find out more. I mean, Laura is here, Mariana is here, a lot of us have have been in the, Laura was the former, one of the chairs of the group. And, you know, the, we are always in the loop for new, new, new Latino friends everywhere in the country. So I think that is a, a good forum to engage more, more, more Latinos from these other areas where Latino population are growing. And I think we need to engage it. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Luis, for that. Anyone else? Yes, the other thing is a, uh, I'm sorry, Amelie, you can go no, ahead. No, go ahead, Ed, go ahead. Um, the other thing is, if there were a targeted um, announcement or a NOSI that indicated that there was an interest in um, uh, looking at these population groups, because what ends up happening is, if they go forward and compete, they'll never have the numbers of some of the larger sites. And so um, something that is focused on um, populations that have not been included, I think would bring out um, uh, Hispanic Latino researchers also. Great. Amelie? Yeah, thank, thank you, Damali. Um, the other is that um, <clears throat> we've been hosting a conference on advancing the science of cancer in Latinos, the, and we've had a very nice distribution of individuals that are coming. But I think that as we can open up more uh, opportunities for, for training and bringing in, you know, some of the early uh, career investigator, Latino investigators, that this would be a, a great way. And then kind of mentoring them up you know, uh, uh, with the, the various uh, Latino researchers would be great. Although we're not, all, we're not a big number either. You know, so, right. <laughs> but, uh, it, it would, that, that might be a exactly. way of dealing with that. <laughs> I will strongly echo that because those also happen to be academic institutions that have a hard time competing against the, the major players in mm -hmm. the So the resources need to be put there if we want the research to capture those populations. Yeah, absolutely. Are there lessons that we could probably take from, you know, those who have um, built research infrastructure, for example, in lower and middle income countries? Um, I would imagine that they're facing very similar challenges to those um, institutions in those areas that, you know, may need additional NIH funding or additional research infrastructure to help pursue that type of research. Great, a lot, lots more comments come in. Um, another uh, question that I would like to pose or food for thought is how do we engage the cancer registries as a whole? When we're thinking about data um, and just thinking about all the challenges that we see in our collection of data, missing data in our registries, um, does anyone know, or has um, there been any engagement with the um, the NASAR, the um, North American Association of Central Cancer Registries? I know that they usually have a conference of year to really engage them on the challenges and working in the Hispanic population, and maybe trying to uh, move for move some of the issues that are experienced in the registries. Uh, through that organization. Um, I would love to hear your thoughts about that. And I don't know if there's anyone that uh, presented on the, the registries could comment on that, if we have any of those speakers. Scarlett, I didn't present on the registry data per se, but I have some familiarity um, being a part of the registry community. I think it's challenging to do anything that will aim to improve actual 
data quality, completeness, accuracy um, through that venue just because we are almost entirely, well, we are entirely reliant on ex data that already exists out there, mm -hmm. whether it be within healthcare facilities, um, vital statistics data, um, other sources of follow-up data. And so I think that the way to approach it um, is to provide incentives um, to those agencies and facilities who are collecting those data mm -hmm. um, to do better about, you know, uh, uh, to improve data completeness. And we've seen that this works, um, you know, in, in specific states where we do have much higher rates of data completeness. Um, it's because many, in many cases, they're incentivized to collect those particular data elements. Um, so I actually think that pushing on accreditation um, uh, organizations mm -hmm. might be one way to um, try to get that to happen. Right. Well, I you, agree Scarlett. with Scarlett. Um, I would also say that NACER has a data standards committee and they, and they do develop standards in combination with um, the National Program of Cancer Registrars and with the, um, and certainly with SEER um, and uh, so there is a history, I haven't been involved with it recently, but there is a history and a very active data standards group. And so I think that the registries actually have surprising ability to get what they want from institutions mm -hmm. because the registries usually are, uh, are, are basically mandated by the state to be able to collect the information. And since they're mandated, they, they do have some flexibility in, um, uh, in trying to promote data standards. So I, I think it is worth a try at the same time. Great, thank you. Any other comments but I on? Think there's a, I think, you know, on top of the registry also, I think it also is important for researchers to think about the disaggregation of the data. You know, we can put it all on SEER or NACER and say mm -hmm. the data has to be collected. But at the same time, if researchers continue to talk about Hispanics, Latinos as a group, as an entity, we are going to always have that problem and make assumptions for groups that are not well represented, sample-wise in it. Hey, thank you, Shoba. Great. There are a lot of uh, comments in the chat box. Um, I'm going to uh, touch on one of those areas. Um, Luis uh, made the comment that he was the only Latino on the study on the main uh, uh, cancer uh, study section for cancer epidemiology for most of his four years. Um, maybe it might be a, a good way for us to discuss um, the importance of trying to diversify the study sections um, in terms of our representatives of, of, of scientists uh, that are allowed to participate. Um, we could touch on and talk about that some more. I think too that would be helpful in helping the scientific community or the scientists that uh, sit on these study sections to understand what are the challenges in doing studies um, on Hispanic populations. So should we uh, talk, uh, chat about that a little bit um, more? Yes, Damali, I think this is a very, very important topic. And thanks for zeroing in on that. I just wanted to share a quick experience, you know, that I have, you know, in terms of the our new initiative on cohorts, you know, we have a new cohort initiative. This is on risk. One of the things as leader of the initiative, I had meetings with you know SROs on this topic. And we needed to make sure we have a very diverse reviewer pool because one of the interests was we wanted in these cohorts to have diversity mm -hmm. in the in the population that would be recruited. And we had very extensive discussions with them. And, and, and I, I think in the end, we had a reasonably uh, good uh, reviewer pool, but I think still much more work needs to be done because although you may submit names, you know, the, the final selection is out of your control. Mm -hmm. So we have to have a more unified approach to get more 
appropriate reviewers with the appropriate expertise. So this is, becomes a question. You, we talk here today a lot about say, okay, a lot of people are doing genetic research. It may be easy because of this, you know, specificity of those type of things. But when you talk about, okay, environmental and modifiable exposures, that's a lot of set of issues. So I really appreciate this comment. Thank you. Sure. Um, Louise, I see you have your hand up. Yes, I think, you know, I think that is a major issue that limit the, or the career of Latinos and of black scientists, yeah. which is, you know, how, I mean, I'm going to quote here, the study section sometimes are whiter than the Oscars. I mean, definitely, I wish we could have more black and brown people sitting in study sections. It's a major bottleneck. I work with many of you. I mean, Damali, you have been actually even emotional support for me to, to try to get this grants at the beginning. I mean, we work closely with, with you, with the program office at the NCI, right? We do everything we are asked. And then we got this highly unfriendly study sections, right? And that is a major bottleneck. There are really, I mean, I think in the NCI, there are a lot of good people, you know, with good intentions, right? But this is this bottleneck of, of these review panels that are so tough for up and coming minority scientists. It's, it is a battle and it has, it has been a battle for a long time. And I'm hoping the new initiatives like NIH Unite is going to look carefully at this because this is where we are filtering our up and coming scientists from, from minority backgrounds. Absolutely, thank you so much for that comment. And I could tell you that I've sat on review sessions where I was the only black scientist or the only woman scientist on the review panel. And that hasn't changed in all the years that I've um, been able to participate in review. So hopefully uh, we need to start uh, making that change now. Uh, we have four minutes uh, left in the session, and I know our next um, speaker is Dr. Ned Sharpless, and I, we want to make sure that we do wrap this up uh, on time at four o'clock, uh, because I know that his schedule is probably pretty tight, and we do appreciate him taking the time to uh, come and speak with us today. Uh, Shoba, do you want to say anything in closing? No? Okay. Um, well, I am going to take the liberty of ending this about three minutes early because <laughs> we really don't want to uh, risk going over time. Um, there's still a lot of comments coming into the chat box. Um, I trust that there will be some follow up with the scientific community at some point. Um, Tram or Joanne, do you want to comment on that? Yes, I would be happy to. Thank you so much, Damali. Sure. This is a great session. And I'll be honest, when I knew this was going to be three days in a row all afternoon, I thought I would be exhausted by the last session. But I'm actually completely energized and um, also really heartened by the fact that we have a lot of support from leadership. Well, I didn't answer your question, did I, Damali? The next steps will be that we will be um, all of the audio and slides from each of the presentations will be put on the website in about a month or two, depending on how quickly we can get it all formatted for um, all of the compliance things that we need to at NCI. And then we will be following up with um, reports and um, you signed up for this workshop, we have your email, you will probably be getting announcements from us once there are rele relevant um, funding announcements and things that come through NIH. Um, we want this, this conversation to continue. So um, does that answer your question, Damali? Absolutely. <laughs> Great. Okay, well, without further ado, I want to, um, Welcome Dr. Ned Sharpless and Dr. Anna Maria Napolis. Um, when I talk about the support we've had from leadership to make this workshop um, possible, it has really been um, heartening and a resounding, how can we help you? And we are grateful. Um, I will turn it over first to Dr. Sharpless and then I'll come back on and I'll introduce Dr. Napolis. And then we will have um, Dr. Lamb um, wrap up this workshop. To everyone participating, you know how to reach us, and we really do want this conversation to continue. Dr. Sharpless. 
Great. Th thank you. Uh, and thank you for inviting me to come speak today. I'm really pleased to be here. This is a very important topic in an area where we certainly can use the advice of, of all of you attending. And I really want to thank the Planning Committee and our Epidemiology and Genomics Research Program and the presenters and participants. And we also should thank uh, NIMHD and NIA and Heart, Lung and Blood for their participation in the meeting as well. You know, I think it's a good time to be having this kind of meeting uh, for a lot of reasons at the NCI. Some, some of the discussion I heard was particularly, particularly relevant to things that we're talking about every day within the NCI. Uh, and, and also, I think it's important to note that we have a real focus on cancer research and cancer progress right now for a lot of reasons, um, not the least of which is a new administration, which has said it wants to make uh, ending cancer as we know it as a top domestic priority. And I think when President Biden says that, you know, when I think probably all of us have heard him say that. He's not talking about ending cancers. We know it for like some people. It's really, we, we wanna have these progress be felt and shared among all individuals who are affected by cancer, regardless of race, ethnicity, wealth, or access. And so, you know, taking on cancer health disparities and understanding what causes disparities in our society is, is an important area for cancer progress uh, that we take very seriously at the NCI. And we've really tried to sort of bake this concept of health equity now into everything we do, be it you know research or our internal NCI culture or how we develop the workforce and things like you know how do we review grants and how do we find uh, you know uh, you know identify scientists for training, for example. So you know we 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 think this is a very important effort. Uh, we have a big focus on equity and inclusion within the NCI, and then we also work closely with the NIH Unite program that was mentioned earlier. And events like this one really help us identify those gaps and really help us figure out where we uh, could do better. NCI is committed to supporting work to better understand and address cancer in Latino populations. Uh, as you know well, the mortality rate for Hispanic individuals diagnosed with cancer remains uh, high in the United States, significantly higher in some types of malignancies for non-Hispanic white individuals. And has been discussed, interpretation of reported incidents, survival and death rates is complicated. We know that rates are underestimated because of misclassification of data on race and ethnicity uh, and single race population estimates uh, derived from the original multiracial categories uh, is uh, a fraught endeavor and, and may lead to errors in our analysis and imprecise analysis of Hispanic subpopulations, for example, as data are particularly disaggregated. And the, the sessions over the last couple of days have showcased the scientific landscape, the research gaps, and some of the methodologic challenges for cancer epidemiologic research in Hispanic populations. It also highlights the importance of collaboration to robustly address disparities and inequity for not only Hispanic communities, but diverse populations across the United States and our need to leverage these resources. We recognize that epidemiology research has been challenging given the diversity of the Latino populations across the country and that you know there is no one single population that can be studied and that it is a complicated uh, from, a, from an epidemiologic point of view, a, a complicated endeavor. This meeting discussed some of these very real difficulties of ensuring that we have the best possible surveillance data for monitoring trends and supporting research. I'm pleased that we've been re recently able to expand the SEER program. I think that's one of the best things the NCI does, and I'm very uh, I'm elated to, to see its further growth, that we now significantly increase the size and diversity of Latino coverage in particular. In addition, some of the new cohorts we funded this year focused on Latino populations. And now, as you know, SEER covers about half of the American population. The Cancer Moonshot also included some important cross-cutting themes of health disparities. I in particular want to thank uh, Dr. Elena Martinez for recently participating with me on a webinar where we sort of updated the cancer community on the progress of the Cancer Moonshot initiatives and this kind of you know, communication to the external community and communication to Congress, frankly, on how successful the Moonshot's been is is very valuable and particularly the commitment in that research effort to disparities research is, is certainly worth mentioning. Over the past year, NCI has expanded its commitment to disparities research, advancing health equity and workforce diversity within the NCI and in the entire cancer research community. With colleagues at NIH, we are really committed to UNITE and have a series of related efforts underway that, at NCI that pertain specifically to cancer research. I'm especially excited about a recent notice of special interest or NOSI to uh, you know, expanding cancer control research for areas affected by persistent poverty. This is something that's been of great interest to uh, the Division of Cancer Control and Population Sciences at NCI led by Bob Proyle. And I think it's a really interesting topic and sort of almost a new paradigm of addressing uh, healthcare disparities. I want to particularly thank Bob for his leadership on this topic and so many. Bob has been a, a real voice of wisdom and experience at the NCI for a long time and, and is 
soon to retire. We will sorely miss uh, Bob Croyle's uh, effective leadership at the NCI, but we have already identified a new director of, of that division, uh, Dr. Katrina Goddard, who will be starting in October, uh, pending clearance by some uh, committee. Uh, hopefully that will go well, and we expect that Katrina will be equally focused on these same topics that, you know, related to cancer health disparities where Bob has been such a leader. I do believe, you know, I think that the president's goal of ending cancer, as you know, it is something we can do. Notice the president didn't say eradicate all cancer. I think, you know, some amount of cancer is a biologic fact, but the tragedy of cancer that we all know, the, the burden of cancer on society is something that I think we can, we can, we can reduce and, and, and even end. So I think the president's goal is well stated and reasonable. Uh, but obviously, this will place a huge premium on innovation and vision. And uh, insights from this meeting, coupled with other efforts across the NCI and NIH, are really helping us inform those future directions of how we you know, dramatically reduce cancer suffering and cancer mortality in the United States. But there are really kind of four areas to highlight. One, we need to imp improve our understanding of the etiology that contributes to differential cancer rates across subpopulations, particularly subpopulations of Hispanic individuals. Secondly, we have to elucidate the factors that influence cancer mortality and survivorship in Hispanic populations. Third, we want to improve the representation of Hispanic individuals in cancer epidemiologic research and, and the definition thereof within our, within our cohorts. And lastly, we want to collaboratively, collaboratively address challenges related to cancer control and prevention in these populations. So I commend all of you for your great work on these uh, past three days and for your uh, help to the NCI. And uh, thank you for your work on, our, on behalf of patients with cancer. And I also thank you for the opportunity to come speak this afternoon. I have a little time to stick around for some discussion if there's time, but I think we also have a speaker from NIMHD. Okay, I, I, can you, you can take five minutes of questions maybe? Oh, my next call got canceled. I can, I, I can actually stay for uh, the next speaker and then take questions with her probably. Oh, I think that would be wonderful. Happy day at the NCI director's office when, uh, you know, something doesn't happen. So, I, and, and this topic is really important and I'd love to stay. I heard some of the discussion before about study sections and things like that. And I, you know, I, I think I, there are probably some questions I could speak to. That'd be wonderful. And we also um, gave everyone the, the press release for the Childhood Cancer Initiative. So I know things all the time, but without, let's oh, I thought I thought you were actually going to mention the press release for the new members of the NCAB. Oh no! Which, uh, There's more. Came out last night. Is very exciting news. Has terrific representation uh, from all cancer disciplines, including uh, Louis Diaz, uh, you know, well-known uh, researcher at Sloan Kettering. John Carpton is the new chair of the NCAB. It's a really exciting group, and uh, you know, I think it's further illustration of the White House's commitment to great cancer research. Thank you. And we've talked a lot about how representation matters, and to that end. Um, we have representation from the first Latina uh, scientific director of the intramural research at the National Institute of Minority Health and Health Disparities, NIMHD, um, Dr. Anna Maria Napolis. Thank you so much. It's, it really is a privilege and an honor to close out um, such a wonderful workshop with so many esteemed contributors and colleagues that I've known for many, many years and also new ones, which uh, we are happy to see join the ranks. I wanna wish everyone ha happy Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, it's probably no coincidence that today is September 16th and it marks uh, Mexican Independence Day. I'm gonna give you a really brief history lesson. Um, it marks a day when a priest, uh, Miguel Hidalgo, issued the Grito or the Cry of Dolores in Dolores, Guanajuato, Mexico, calling for the independence of Mexico from the Spanish crown. And the other important things that are overlooked is not only was he calling for Mexico's independence, um, point Spain had implemented a caste system that was based on race that resulted in extreme racial inequities in, in Mexico at the time and that continued to this day, much like in the US and the history here with African-Americans. So the Spanish um, had developed this complex caste system based on race for social control and privilege. Uh, Padre Hidalgo called for an uprising of the indigenous people. Um, and he also called for the end of slavery and redistribution and return of lands to indigenous people along with the call for racial equality. But that public cost him his life through a horrible um, execution. And my parents who were born in rural villages in Mexico um, told us that story as children. 
that uh, remains uh, an inspiration to this day. And the, the reason uh, why I do this, the research that I do in Latina breast cancer survivors. In a cosmic sort of way, um, I'm gonna tell you another story. Just three months ago, I reconnected with some of my oldest family friends from my childhood um, that I had not seen in years. My youngest daughter, Vanessa, had just moved to Albuquerque, New Mexico. And I saw it as an opportunity to reunite our families and to carry on um, that, you know, in the, into the next generation, those strong relationships we had had in childhood with this family, uh, the Baca family. So we re reconnected, and uh, in this reunion, I also learned that Robert Baca, the oldest son who's my age, um, was uh, diagnosed prior with cancer. And um, just September 7th, I received a call from his mother letting me know that he passed away. So um, just three months later, Robert Buck is no longer with us. And I'm sure many and many, many of you have lost close friends and family members to this horrible um, disease um, that we call cancer. And they died prematurely. And so that's what we need to change. You know, research is, and your roles are, is so critical to closing these health equity gaps. We have such advances in sophisticated imaging and um, blood work that detects cancer earlier. We have remote monitoring of patients in cancer clinical trials. We have targeted therapies and precision oncology. We have an extraordinary opportunity to end the tragic impact of cancer in our communities and our families. So I'm calling uh, you all to, I've heard and appreciate um, during this workshop about interim stopgap measures to uh, aggregate data to be able to better study the heterogeneity of the female Hispanic population in the US. But don't people like Robert Baca deserve their own studies, focused studies? These approaches to data aggregation are short-term fixes until better data can be obtained from better studies. Health equity demands that we raise the bar and consider the endpoint from the beginning phase of our studies, and that is in the planning and design phases, that we seek out the communities, the vulnerable communities who are experiencing these cancer disparities, and we ask the right questions, we design the right studies, and we recruit sufficient persons to allow for valid comparisons, and to know that the clinical uh, implications of our work is generalizable to these understandings. The de facto exclusion of Hispanics and Latinos in clinical research can be addressed. We have methods that are evidence-based, such as patient navigators and partnerships with community-based organizations that have been proven to increase enrollment and to also increase um, the success of our studies in terms of engaging communities and having positive results. Without intentional efforts to enroll these populations and diversify the biomedical workforce among these groups that are and have been underrepresented historically, our research vectors, uh, excuse me, our research will in effect uh, perpetuate this underrepresentation. We now number more than 60 plus million Latinos living in the US. That's one in five Americans. We have an opportunity as Anil had put in the chat with all these new funding announcements and also with this new cohort study called Connect for Pre Prevention, for Cancer Prevention, where we're enrolling 200,000 adults, right, ages 40 to 65, to investigate cancer etiology and outcomes to inform um, epidemiologic and prevention efforts. And my question to you is a tremendous opportunity. And when the U.S. Census tells us that 19% of our population is Latino, I want to know what the results, the clinical results from the Connect study and studies like this be powered uh, to, and sufficiently uh, have adequate representation of our Latino community to be able to know that we have valid results that can be applied in these populations. And I would encourage you to ask yourself as campers three questions. The first of these is, can these scientific advances that will be generated from my study be applied and disseminated in low resource settings with diverse populations. And diversity in terms of um, socioeconomic status, literacy, language, national, et cetera. Second question, 
what would it take to do so to make those results generalizable and applicable and able to be disseminated in a practical way? What does it really take? And the third question is, who do we leave behind if we don't consider the context in which these studies are implemented? Is uh, the de facto exclusion occurring in terms of who benefits from our research, right? So let's, let's also not forget the upstream causes of some of these disparities. Right now, the National Academies of Sciences and the National Cancer Policy Forum are sponsoring webinar series that will culminate um, in, a, in a workshop called Promoting Health Equity in Cancer Care in the US. And that will be occurring October 25th through the 26th. And these webinars are addressing fundamental causes of disparities, including housing insecurity, uh, transportation needs, food insecurity among cancer patients and their families. So in addition to improving our mechanistic understanding of carcinogenesis, and precision oncology, we also need studies of structural determinants of health and cancer care and cancer outcomes. Until we address these upstream societal drivers of health disparities and cancer inequities, we'll continue to replicate what we already know, right? And our progress on cancer disparities will be piecemeal, incremental, and unsatisfying to the consumers of our research, that is cancer patients and their families. So I just wanna close and circle back to Padre Hidalgo's words, um, the person who launched the Mexican revolution. Action, and it's sad that these words still ring today. <laughs> Action must be taken at once. There is no time to be lost. We shall yet see the oppressor's yoke broken and the fragments scattered on the ground. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Um, okay, we do have 15 minutes and I think this is a great chance. Um, it doesn't happen very often that you have these two great minds here to ask these questions who can actually make a difference. Um, if you raise your hand on Zoom, we can have, um, everyone's been muted, but if you raise your hand on Zoom, then we will unmute you and allow you to ask um, your question. Um, and I have one question in the chat here asking about um, funding opportunities at NCI for um, modifiable risk factors in childhood cancers. So I guess Modifiable risk factors in childhood cancers. Um, in terms of cause or outcome or survivorship, I think, you know, we, yeah, we, we, uh, let me see uh, a couple of things going on interesting in childhood cancer. Um, and there may be others from the NCI who are here who are, who are able to chime in if I, if I forget something. Um, I think uh, we have increased the uh, portfolio of funding for childhood cancer research. Uh, over the last few years for a variety of reasons. Uh, the STAR Act, a congressional initiative, uh, required the NCI to uh, particularly address the, the topic of childhood cancer survivorship, which is uh, welcome. I, I think that is an area where we had a needed, needed research and, and really taken that on with a dedicated funding in that topic uh, over the last few years. We've also recruited a new uh, director in the Office of Survivorship at, at NCI, Emily, uh, Emily Tonerezos, who uh, I think has been uh, very helpful. And in particular, her, although she does all of survivorship, she has a particular interest in pediatric survivorship and in long-term uh, issues. Additionally, we have the Childhood Cancer Data Initiative, which is a $50 million a year times 10 years, a $500 million initiative to try and aggregate childhood uh, cancer data from a variety of sources, uh, including some registry-like sources uh, leading to the National Childhood Cancer Registry that Lynn Penberthy is leading. And, uh, and I think that is useful for a variety, you know, great data like that can be used for a variety of purposes, including things like studying risk factors for childhood cancer and risk factors for bad outcome in childhood cancer. So that, that effort uh, is, you know, intended to take on lots and lots of uses for childhood cancer research, but I think would be directly useful. If there are more specific funding announcements that I haven't mentioned, um, uh, perhaps others from the NCI might be able to chime in or we can track that down and, and get back to the, to the uh, person who asked the question. Thank you. 
Yes, and we um, the question was geared towards etiology, and also we have Star Act money that's been going to childhood cancer. Um, and but the, certainly we can get back in touch with uh, you some dot. Thank you. Um, there's a question to ask: What have we learned from the efforts in COVID nineteen that can be um, applied to our work here? Yeah, I, I don't know if Anna wants to to go first. I, we've learned a lot. I mean, you know, um, clinical trials changed a lot during the pandemic. So we uh, had a cruel plummet in clinical trials for a few months there uh, for a variety of reasons that I think are familiar to this group. And um, we talked to the FDA right away, I very quickly had conversations with the FDA about uh, modifying our trials to make them more kind of pandemic friendly. So we did things like allow for consent to be obtained by phone to enroll someone on a trial or allowed an IND, you know, experimental medicine, if it was oral to be shipped directly to the patient rather than having them come into an investigational pharmacy in a hospital or something. And uh, we made a lot of use of telemedicine, you know, a lot of visits by telemedicine or visits to non-traditional providers and et cetera. And, and so I, I think, um, you know, that has been very popular. We've polled both our patients and the clinical trialists and these flexibilities that were really created to deal with the pandemic are extremely popular, both with the patients and the doctors and the caregivers related. And, and, and so I, I hope we won't see these things go away. I hope that you know, some of these things that we've learned about how to do clinical trials, we can continue to use um, post-pandemic because they really are an opportunity to reach po particularly populations that may have low access to clinical trials. You know, if you can do things like telemedicine and role trials in non-traditional spaces. Um, but I, I, and I think it's mostly good news here. I think, uh, you know, the things that NCI can control and the FDA, you know, we can reason with, uh, will be able to persist post pandemic, but I'm also already starting to hear, you know, some backsliding largely related to payers, but also related to, uh, state and local healthcare, uh, sort of, uh, entities that, you know, some of these walls that are blocking telehealth are being re-erected. So for example, you know, giving care across state lines, has been a problem for cancer centers. And uh, that was sort of done away with during the pandemic. And now those are sort of coming back. It's largely a payer decision in many instances. And I, you know, I hope patients will um, make their uh, opinions known. I, patients really don't like not being told that they can't see a doctor across state lines. And, and you know, they, they were able to do that during the pandemic. And uh, you know, if those, as those barriers are re-erected, we, we have to make sure they're really for good reasons and not just for uh, arbitrary reasons. Uh, that's one example, but we learned a whole lot more. We learned we can run a $6.6 billion organization by phone effectively by Zoom Jet. You know, I, I think, you know, we dispersed grants and funded new, new initiatives, and it was really spectacular the way the NCI, you know, program officials sort of rose to the occasion. And, and it was shockingly, I mean, I, I really kind of had to pinch myself early on in the, in the pandemic how well things worked from a, you know, administering grants and reviewing grants point of view, because I did not think that was going to go so smoothly. Uh, so those are two things we've learned, but there's a lot more. Um, Dr. Napolis, you are. I would say, yes, uh, from a, my perspective is intramural now. So um, not that I, you know, I was an extramural research from it, researcher for many, many years. Intramurally, we have seen a drop off in um, successfully completed visits with the transition to telemedicine and telehealth. So I think that has had implications for limited English proficient or low literacy populations or less um, IP uh, savvy populations. So I think we need to figure out what the impact is on a population level as well as um, community level of transitioning to telemedicine when we have uh, a pandemic in effect and um, want to reduce the risk of uh, contagion. And I would say the other thing is that um, the SEAL initiative has demonstrated the importance of working with communities in partnership to reach some of these populations that disproportionately uh, experience the burden of uh, disease and death uh, from COVID. So those two lessons are really important lessons we can carry throughout. I think that we, we, um, we need to better understand how we can capitalize and uh, work with communities to reach these, these vulnerable populations, as well as uh, tele use technology to expand the role of uh, community-based organizations and patient navigators and so forth and healthcare providers who are working in these safety net settings. What, and I think this, 
goes to Dr. Sharpless. What efforts are in place to make sure that all new cohorts include at least 18% Hispanic, Latino, or 30% if in states with that? Or so what efforts are in place to make sure that the population being captured in the cohort matches the population in the representative area? Right, so representation in cohorts. And I, I presume the question is both about clinical trials cohorts and epidemiologic cohorts, where the answer sure. is not the same. Yep. Uh, so let me do clinical trials cohorts first. Um, that's been a challenging area, I think, as everyone is aware. Um, you know, when I was at FDA, we had hours and hours of meetings on this topic. And really, as I think most of you know, the FDA has limited powers to, um, you know, if, if, if a manufacturer comes in with a great drug and they haven't t tested a diverse population, you know, what can the FDA do? They they can't not approve a great drug, but they can't also, you know, so it, it, it's not a, a simple situation for them. And, and, and so uh, the NCI, we have a little more control because we, we control disbursement of funds for the trials and have, uh, you know, really made a diversity in clinical trials rule a, a high priority for the NCI for, for years now. Yeah, I think WARDA may have shown some of these data. If not, um, you know, we, we can certainly provide them, but WARDA McCaskill Stevens has data in INCOR. Uh, and across the NCTN network uh, for uh, uh, clinical trials accrual by minority populations. And it's, I would say it's pretty good, actually. I mean, the data for Hispanic uh, it, participation is, is quite good and has increased sharply in the last few years. Uh, African-American participation is now, I think, up to 11%, which is about the frequency of the, popula of the population in the United States that, that gets cancer that African-American. So it's, it's not quite the same as the general population, but it's close and is improving as well, but it has not improved to the same extent as the Hispanic population. Um, and, uh, you know, that's really worth commenting on because that is much better than industry. If you look at industry trials in terms of clinical trials accrual, uh, they are not as good as the NCI data. And uh, so it, now, I, you know, industry would like to do a better job of this and have asked us, you know, what, what are you doing? How does this, what, what is uh, the secret to uh, improving accrual? And by the way, I don't want to, Anyway, try and claim that we have accrual solved. We still need further work to do here, and I, I'm not I'm not making that point. But uh, you know, I think a big part of what has led to some success in terms of improving accrual in NCI has been, you know, the the INCOR is structured in such a way that it, it goes to where patients live, and it makes participation in a clinical trial relatively straightforward. So we have you know INCOR institutions that are minority serving institutions that you know where patients don't have to go to some new hospital and sit in traffic and go to a cancer center, and you know it take a day off of work and find childcare and all those, all those barriers to participation in clinical trials. And I think, I think that's a, a you know, the, as I think this group is aware, the INCOR network is widely distributed across the United States as more than a thousand sites. And, and so I, th I think that is a, uh, a, a good strategy. Uh, it doesn't work for all kinds of accrual, but I think it, it can be useful when, um, when taken uh, in both uh, clinical trials accrual and epidemiologic cohorts, we can, um, condition funding on uh, diverse clinical trials, but you know, it's, it's not, um, these are generally grants. And so uh, I, I think uh, this group of sophisticated grant funded investigators knows how grants works. And, and so we can't, they're not really deliverables. We can't say, oh, you, you only had 7%, it should have been 9% or something. We're not gonna fund you. We, you know, the study section considers that at review and may say the participation of, in a minority accrual was not as good as it should have been. And therefore we're gonna dock them. In terms of their funding priority score, but you know we really don't, you know after the fact it gives the money back because you didn't accrue the right population. So and, and that's that that I think is the way it should be. I think grant you know grant funding should include some flexibility for a variety of reasons that I, I think this group knows a lot about. You know I, I but you know the other question about epidemiologic cohorts in general is. Um, you know, we have extramural cohorts that, uh, that are, uh, I think, successful and, but, you know, are, are generally funded through peer review. And uh, now we have the aforementioned uh, intramural cohort connect where, uh, you know, diversity of that population has been a major focus of its construction and intended design. We will monitor connect and make sure that it is, you know, in, in, enrolling a representative population and have chosen sites with that in mind. But, um, Obviously, this is an issue that we spend a lot of time thinking about. I think there are others on the on the. I think I think I think I saw Kathy Cronin might be here. So you know, there there are others who could speak to this uh, more forcefully about what the NCI does. But suffice it to say, is a top priority for the National Cancer Institute. There was some um, concern yesterday from um, that the Connect population is five percent Hispanic, which doesn't match the U.S. distribution. So. We have reported that, and I know you have one minute left, I think, for both of you. 
And I have one pressing question for both of you. We talked about trying to boost um, support for Hispanic Latino investigators. And the comment was made quite often, there's um, trying to um, support all levels of researchers from doctoral students to postdocs to you know, assistant faculty, and then even senior faculty um, that are underrepresented. My more, minorities typically have more underreported minority students as well. And so trying to make sure that there is that continued path to success. Um, what are both of your institutions doing to further that success? Anna, you want to go first? Uh, well, intramurally, you know, the problem is, I, I was just putting this in a, a chat note to Amelie, is that there are, there are so few of us, you know, in terms of researchers that have the experience and have been doing this for so long. And, um, I, you know, I'm sure I, I'm probably getting nods from many of the people who are in this workshop. And so we try our best. And I think intramurally, NIMHG is doing a tremendous job in mentoring diverse trainees across the spectrum, everything from, you know, po from postbacs up to postdocs and uh, new investigators and trying to diversify our workforce. I'm less familiar with what's going on on the extramural side, but the issue is always that there are uh, so few of us. So it really, really takes um, building that base of researchers that is interested in Latino cancer disparities research uh, in everything from basic science up to population health and disseminating that knowledge across, um, uh, you know, I get contacted all the time as I'm sure Amelie and Luis and, and uh, others, Laura on the, uh, and Mariana on the call um, today by researchers across the country who are in under-resourced academic institutions and they're the one Latino researcher or the one researcher non-Latino who is interested in Latino health and cancer. And so um, it's, I, you know, there's no magic bullet. I just think we need to invest resources and support the people that are doing it and doing it well and foster those networks of career development. Um, and I know that NCI is doing a lot of work in that space, but um, it really it also makes a difference when the re researchers are from the uh, groups that are that are being developed, right? Because there's a connection, and I think there's um, there's a need for more people who are Latinos doing this type of work to encourage other Latinos and serve as role models. Yeah, I was seeing. Uh, I think Monsi Garcia Closis is on the call and maybe better able to speak to connect than I am uh obviously being intimately involved in the design of the covert um i will i will answer the uh the training question i think that um this is something we've looked at very hard at the national cancer institute and I've talked about publicly we've looked at the sort of pipeline if you will so uh both uh who is getting our grants who are in our training programs and most importantly uh, or a very important metric is who's getting ro1s you know who are, who are getting those investigator initiated independent grants to become independent scientists and that's i think a reasonable proxy for who are going to be the, the the future scientific workforce that the nci supports and you know the the, the data are not great i think um the diversity of the rpg pool is much less than we would like uh, it has not improved to the extent that we would like, despite, you know, being worried about this problem for some time. Certainly the concern about the RPG pool diversity long predates me at the NCI. Um, uh, you know, there are some challenges to addressing this problem. It is not as straightforward as you, you might imagine for reasons that, uh, you know, I have to do with federal law and rules about the grants uh, criteria. But I think that, uh, you know, we, we have a, a couple of things to uh, try and work on uh, it, it, making sure the workforce is, is truly diverse. One is we um, have programs that really try and identify scientists at a very early age to get them interested in science and interested in biomedical research, interested in cancer in particular. And so uh, these are things like the CURE program, the Continuing Umbrella for Research Excellence at a VCRCHD, as well as the YES program, the you know, Say Yes to 25, to the, the R25 program we do. And these programs may go to even a middle school and certainly uh, high school and college and uh, or undergrad and grad school and through at the postdoc level. And we'll try and support individuals at every stage of their career from diverse backgrounds so that um, 
those those individuals can be then successful as independent scientists at some later date. Uh, we have also, um, I think, aggressively tried to use select pay. You know, that is, uh, as I think most of you are aware, the NCI uses a pay line for R01 funding, but then goes beyond it to choose other grants beyond the pay line. I think it's obvious why the NCI should do that. Uh, you know, if we don't have enough breast cancer grants and we have all, you know, lymphoma grants or something, then we, you know, have to go outside the pay line for reasons of topic, topic diversity. That is one of many reasons we use select pay, certainly not the only reason. And we have tried to use select pay uh, to uh, increase diversity of thought within the RPG pool and, 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 and to make sure that we have a diverse background of recipients. And, and that is an area where I think, uh, you know, perhaps we could, we and other ICs could do more. Uh, additionally, um, I think we have tried to make sure that we are focusing on topics that are uh, of importance to the public health and the Hispanic, pub uh, the public health of Hispanic individuals. And so that is our large focus on cancer health disparities research and, and, and some of the efforts that we've spoken about in these last few days. Uh, I, I will note that, you know, if you look at our CDC coding, this way of, you know, keeping score of what the NIH NCI spends money on, you know, that's now to the tune of $500 million a year. It is a massive investment in health disparities research. I think something like 80% of the grants or 70% of the grants in DCCPS now have a cancer health disparities component. You know, the NCI is really all in. Also, I think many of you are aware we've had a major kind of refocusing of the uh, community outreach and engagement within the Cancer Center program, which is highly visible and very important. And I think all of you that are, in, you know, that are somehow entwined with the Cancer Center have felt that oomph from the Cancer Center program to get out and really understand the catchment area and address the health problems of the catchment area, particularly underrepresented populations within the catchment area. So those, those are, I think, some of the things we can do uh, and we plan to do more. You know, we're, we're talking about, you know, new diversity awards, new, uh, perhaps new language to the guide in the CCSG, the Cancer Center Grant, for example, about, you know, how to incentivize certain behaviors. And uh, so stay tuned. I think this is, as I mentioned, an area of very active interest in the NCI inclusion and uh, equity inclusion program, and certainly also an interest of the NIH Unite program and so I think the more will be coming out soon. Oh, one other really important thing to mention, uh, very cool, is the first initiative, uh, you know, the Common Fund program to, you know, fund cohorts led by NCI and NIMHD, and it has been terrific working with our, our partners there. Uh, that, that first round of funding is going to be announced soon, but we'll have two more rounds of funding. And I think if you're an institution that is committed to training a diverse faculty, you have to apply for this award. You have to go tell your provost and your dean that this is an award you have to get because, you know, this is... Uh, something that will really say that your institution is committed to this and you really make faculty diversity a priority. And it's a very, very uh, nice effort. And I think um, it, it's a very interesting experiment that's really creating these cohorts of uh, underrepresented minority faculty at institutions lead to uh, their enhanced career development. And so I think uh, this is a really important initiative supported by Building One by Francis Collins, but also you know, the NCI and MIHD are really pleased to play a leadership role in that, that new initiative. Well, we have kept you longer than the time we were allowed to. So thank you so much for your generosity and your time and with the work you both support. I'll tell you, I just had a funding announcement this year that um, was large cohorts for survivor cohorts and two thirds of the grants were focused on Hispanic populations. So we really are, um, we really are moving the needle in this and um, I just say thank you to both of you for coming today. I'll give you one last chance to say anything, um, even though you're 10 minutes over. I'm sure people are pulling you in all directions. Thank you so much for the opportunity to come today and for the lively discussion. And I wish this were in person. I, um, you know, miss these meetings at Shady Grove. We will have them soon. But till then, uh, you know, Zoom's going to have to do. It's good seeing you all, at least virtually. Thank you so much. And I'll turn it over to um, Dr. Lamb or Dr. Napolis for you. Sorry, I'll give you one final. Um, you know, one of the things we learned in the 25 years of uh, mentoring uh, underrepresented investigators through the RICMAR program that NIA funded is these programs have to be sustained over time. So when you have a successful program like Exico, which was training cancer control researchers, you have to sustain these programs because they're, they work and they're generating that next generation of researchers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess I, I want to share, um, say a just a few uh, words. Uh, thank you, Ned and Anna, uh, 
for such a wonderful closing remarks and for taking the time to answer questions. Uh, we have now reached the end of our time together, way past the time, uh, as our country is in, becoming increasingly more diverse and with it requires thoughtful conversations and actionable considerations uh, of the impact on cancer control and uh, care in the near future. The ability to be able to gather virtually and fully engage with you all during a pandemic is a blessing. This meeting's focus on cancer epidemiology research is important as epidemiologic studies can help inform interventions that are multi-level and multifactorial to address disparities and promote equity. The last three days have been informative and educational, covering a wide range of topics that are relevant not only to cancer research, but other disciplines all interrelated to the well-being of a large heterogeneous population. This meeting has also raised important complex questions that have been underscored. And one that I would like to ask you to think actively uh, is how we can work collaboratively and more effectively, leveraging resources and our collective power to ensure representation of diverse populations in our research, as well as the next generation of researchers. I think LSAO said it's best that we have strength in number. And to better understand the anticipated cancer burden of our nation, we will need in innovative population-based studies with racial and ethnic relevant exposure factors, including social determinants uh, of a diverse population, including racial and ethnic groups, as well as other understudied populations. Uh, Dr. Shopless stressed that insights from this meeting will help inform future directions and advance efforts to improve our understanding and move the needle forward. I want to mention one way in which we are already working to bring greater attention and focus to cancer research in the Hispanic populations. The journal Cancer Epidemiology, Biomarkers and Prevention has established a dynamic online collection focusing on topical studies. The collection is named after this workshop, Cancer Epidemiology in Hispanic Populations. It will highlight cancer epidemiolo epidemiologic research focusing on Hispanic population published within the last couple of years and moving forward. Uh, we want to thank Dr. Uh, Scarlett Gomez for facilitating this effort and to encourage you to submit your research to grow this collection. Dr. Koi also highlighted that the NCI workshop is part of a larger effort, highlighted the groundbreaking work of Dr. Amelie Ramirez, as well as Dr. Edward Torbido. I want to mention that the third international conference on advancing the science of cancer in Latino in San Antonio, Texas, which they both co-chair, will take place in February 23 to 25th, 2022. Once again, Shoba, Joanne, and I, on behalf of NCI, thank you for your participation and contributions over the last three days. Until we meet again, have a wonderful day. Thank you.